So a while back, like several years ago, actually 2015, I decided to, to rewrite the Henry Sayre book um, and on the, um, on art. And when I did it, I, I noticed that there wasn't an introduction, at least there was one, but it, um, it didn't really help clarify certain kinds of art and, and why we should appreciate certain kinds of art. Um, most of us are used to representational art, art that looks realistic. Um, but there's some kinds of art that we'll talk about in a little bit that maybe don't make any sense at all. And so I'm going to take you on, it's actually a journey of my own learning, but also the journey of, um, of Ukrainian Russian artist Kazimir Mayevich, um, who went from doing art that looks like the everyday things that we recognize to art that was totally non-objective, what a lot of people call abstract, but we'll learn as a different term. Um, and through this journey, we're gonna try to figure out what kind of questions you need to ask yourself so you can better understand art. So when I, when I was a kid, I, I grew up in Wharton, Texas. It's a, it's a town, it's a relatively big town, but not anywhere near as, as large as Houston. In fact, it's nowhere near. It's only like population of 9,000 people. And um, my parents had, you know, like they're smart people, but they had relatively provincial, narrow taste in art. And um, they liked people like Norman Rockwell, who's on the this painting of his is on the left. And they liked Charlie Russell, and um, he's a cowboy painter on the right. And uh, this kind of art was really easy to understand for me and for them. Um, this is called representational art. This is art that's any work of art that seeks to resemble the world of natural appearances. Um, it was, it was, it made sense because in representational art, um, people look like real people. And so it's really easy to digest and to understand. Um, the kind of art I didn't understand at all was modern or contemporary art, like, um, just didn't make any sense to me. Like, I, th I thought of it as just like blobs on canvas. Um, so when, when I was like, maybe it was like 13 or 14 or something, um, my parents took our family, we drove into Houston, we went to the Museum of Fine Arts. And I don't know if any of you've ever been there, but like when you walk into the older building, um, you, after you pay, you go up the stairs, there's this area that's known as the mezzanine area. And in that area, there was an exhibition of works by Kazimir Maevich. And this painting here on the left, this is the first non-representational painting I ever remember seeing and especially seeing in person. Um, so back then, the guards were a little less strict than they are now. And I walked up to this painting and I got up, like I got up as close as you can get to it without actually touching it. Like my nose was probably half an inch away from it because I thought if I looked at it close enough, then maybe I would begin to understand it. And this is, a painting by Mayevich called Suprematist Composition White on White. It's a white canvas, it's textured. It's hard to see in a slide, but it, there's, there's a lot of texture to the surface. And on that white texture surface, there's a, a tilted square 
that is also white and textured. So this kind of art is, is what's known as non-representational or non-objective art. And this is art, it makes no obvious reference to the natural world. It has no recognizable subject matter. A lot of times it's um, shapes or colors or lines. Um, but we, we're, we're, all we're gonna do when we look at this is we're gonna see a square on top of another square. We don't see like a person or a cat or a dog or a tree, unless you have a really good imagination. So I walked up really close and I was just trying to get it and I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. And I did not get it for decades until I started teaching art history at Village Lily College in um, Stevenson, Maryland. So, but at 14, this made no, no sense at all. This is me at 18 and not 14. It's my graduation picture before I had wrinkles and gray hair and scars. Um, so, so when you're looking at a work of art like that or any other work of art, um, it's, it's important to ask yourself questions about it and maybe dig a little deeper and do a little research, especially on those that when you look at them, you don't get them or, or you think my four year old could have painted that. Um, so, so we're going to go back to Malievich's painting. We're going to ask like who painted this and when and where and how did they grow up? So we already know Malievich painted it. He was born in 1879 in Ukraine, Russia. His parents were Polish. They were migrant workers. Um, they moved around a lot and they, they worked on beet farms and sugar mills and in railroad construction. They, they went wherever the job was. Um, they certainly did not have any access to galleries or museums. And believe it or not, they did not have the internet or a cell phone. Can you believe that? That's just the craziest thing I've ever heard. So how did he get here? How did he get to this painting? So was he exposed to any art as a child? Well, yeah, he was. Um, it wasn't like the kind of art you might see in a museum back then. But one thing he was exposed to was traditional Ukrainian embroidery. This is a really ancient tradition in Ukraine. Uh, it was a practice done by primarily women. And, um, and it, it, go, it goes all the way back, like there's recorded all the way back to the first century AD. So like a, on this embroidery, there's, there's, not, there's not figures, there's, there's not animals or objects, there's, there's geometric patterns. Um, a lot of times there'll be diamonds or squares, the color's really limited, uh, doesn't go much beyond black and red and white, sometimes they'll be blue, sometimes they'll be yellow, it's really totally limited. And um, the, you know, it's not arbitrary what they've done, like these shapes and they, they have meaning. And a lot of times the symbolism will have to do with um, protection or fertility, fertility as it relates to women, but also animals and having good crops and things like that. Um, this, like this diamond shape, it'll either represent um, a sown field, a field that they planted crops in, or, or a fertile woman. So that's one kind of thing he looked at. And, and something else that, you know, they're Catholic and then the Russian Byzantine church and the, or I'm sorry, Russian Orthodox church. And they, he would have seen in, church a lot of icons and the uh, 
religious icons and the religious icons would have either the saints or Mary or Christ. And a lot of times the figure would be, uh, it would be like a frame within a frame. And then there might be additional little rectangular shapes in there with, with words. And these icons, they, they revered them and they touched them frequently so they frequently had to be repainted and they like if you were sick you would take an icon and you would soak it in milk and then drink the milk because they believed it had healing properties and then something else you would see were you know these were really cheap woodcuts they were called lube key prints and lube key prints they would either, um, there was like an old tradition relating back to the 17th century and they um, were sold at carnivals or fairs and they were really inexpensive and they were printed on paper and they, um, a lot of times they would have the images or, and text from folk tales or mythology or religious texts or like even propaganda later on people would use them to decorate homes and you can look at this and the colors in this are like really similar they wouldn't always be similar but the ones in this one are really similar to the ukrainian embroidery where we have red and black and white and then you know look at these and you're gonna think like well the imagery is different but what do these all have in common? Look at them really carefully and we see rectangular and square shapes. And in most of these, we see a really very limited use of color. There's not like a million colors in these, not even in the icon, which is pretty much limited to blue and silver, maybe a little gold and some white. So his dad, like so many dads, like my dad, did not want him to be an artist. He wanted him, you know, like to be in the same profession he was in, or if he was lucky, which back then, he, if you were uh, like a migrant worker, you pretty much say migrant worker. Um, like there wasn't room for advancement really. Um, but his dad was just like, he didn't want him to study art, but his mom encouraged it. And she encouraged him to take art classes. I don't know how they could afford it, but they did. And he was really good. And then he got um, scholarships to study at the Kiev School of Art and the Moscow School of Art. And when he was at those schools, he starts broadening his idea of what art is about, because then he's, exposed to art from Western movements from the late 19th century. And these movements would include Impressionism. The Impressionists were um, primarily French artists. This originated out of France in the 1860s. And uh, Impressionists, they would work relatively quickly. They were interested in painting candid glimpses of everyday life. Um, they would, they like to see, they really were interested in how light affected color. You know, like if it's really bright colors outside and sunny, colors are gonna look different than if it's gray and muggy outside or if it's night. They painted outside a whole lot and they painted like, during all these different weather conditions because they again they were interested in how light affected the color of their work um and then um like people in this group were sorry about that people in this group were people like Renoir and um, Pizarro and Claude Monet who you may or may not recognize their names and then right after that period around the uh late 1800s, early 1900s are the post-impressionists. Those are, you know, you've heard of Van Gogh before and there's Gauguin and 
uh, Toulouse Lautrec, and they were um, they weren't so much interested in naturalism, like in terms of color and stuff. There, they um, they were like real interested in structure of things and the form of things, but they were also very interested in expressing their feelings and their emotion. And sometimes they would use, uh, the colors they would pick would not be necessarily natural. They would, they would be arbitrarily picked, like either because they liked the way they looked or when you got to Van Gogh, he believed that each color had a symbolism and it's somebody else's Kandinsky. He believed that the colors symbolized sounds and um, so and these these impressionist artists we use like really visible brush strokes in their work and then um, there was also another group of artists that um, Kandinsky got exposed to and that was the symbolists and the symbolists they um, they wanted their work to be mysterious and they didn't want you to uh, to really fully know what it meant. They wanted their the meaning to be ambiguous, and they um, they rejected the visual um, realism of the impressionists, and their work became a little more what's known as abstract, where you're still painting trees, but you're you're kind of exaggerating the color or the shapes of things. And a lot of their imagery would have references to the Bible or mythological creatures. Or a lot of times there would be like severed heads or monsters or glowing and smoking um, spirits. And the artists in this group are, um, would include include people like Odalone Radon, who I always liked because of the way his name sounds, did, or like Gustave Moreau. So, so, so these kids that were going to this school in Kiev and Moscow, they would see this, and they were very much influenced by this. And this is a painting that Majevich painted while he was still in art school. And you can see that he's, you know, like, He's, he's using those daubs and dashes of the post-impressionist. Colors are really pastel. Um, but he, like, for some reason, he's really attracted to a lot of white in this, which, oops, look, you see white over here too. But you gotta think about this. This is a big jump from this painting of a house with trees to 13 years later, this painting of a white, square on a white square so how did it get there well well we have to we have to consider before we get to how he got there what was going on in this country and nobody lives in a vacuum and i'm sure because of covid19 there's going to be a lot of changes in the way people produce work now um that is going to have be affected of what we are all living through. So nobody lives in a vacuum. Whatever happens around you, both immediately and in your own country and around the world, can affect you. So what was happening in Russia at that time, which is where Kazimir Mayevich lived in Ukraine, which is part of Russia back then. So there, there was, um, it was Russia was ruled by the Tsar Nicholas the Second. At this time, um, and he's a cousin of King George V of England and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Um, the the government run by him was really, in some ways, really weak and ineffective. There were too many important uh, appointments that his wife decided upon under the. Um, under the sway of Grigory Rasputin, who was this crazy, charismatic, mystical faith healer, who like, so the Tsar Nicholas and his wife, 
Alexandra, they had, they had a bunch of kids, and the youngest kid um, had um, he, he had hemophilia, where like if he got hit or something or bumped into something, he would start bleeding uncontrollably. And they they brought brought in Rasputin, who support supposedly like hypnotized him with a pocket watch and like didn't cure him, but healed him that one particular time and and uh, Rasputin belonged to this sect that believed that the way to get in touch with God was having a lot of sex so we don't know what was going on with him and the Tsarina um, Alexandra and so he he really influenced her and he was getting her to recommend all these people and they weren't you know like they really weren't meant to govern they were very ineffectual and then like while that was going on also like um in russia which was predominantly rural at that time which is probably also still kind of in some ways there are giant gaps between the very very poor and the and the wealthy the the ruling class the land owning class um there the 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 dynasty was like really out of date everything it did was from these medieval times and like the church and the they had a, like a really codified class system where you had to stay in your class you couldn't rise and then um the area that the czar ruled was giant there was like four thousand miles across and 125 million people who spoke all sorts of languages and the czar was like supported by the secret police the Ukraine, and the military the cossacks and people would inform on each other and it's like really hard country to manage and at the same time it's going undergoing drought and famine and it recently like had a war against japan japan's tiny russia's giant and and japan won and so this all made the czar really unpopular and people were wanting to modernize they were wanting to change so like all sorts of stuff was going on and the and the czar like resisted reform and then there was a peasant revolt and then uh, the they the czar's um soldiers came out and killed a thousand there wasn't really a revolt they were protesting peacefully and killed a thousand protesters including women and children um well killed and wounded them so anyway it was like nuts and and people wanted change and and included among those people are artists like they they want to do things differently so when uh, um, Malevich was in Russia he started becoming friends with all of these innovative artists so um, and and they were also like some of these artists were looking to the West um, Western democracies as models but also Western art so there's a lot of change going on in the West too part of this is the in Italy, there's the the futurist, and the futurist um, it was characterized like it's 1908 and uh, I'm sorry, 1909 to 1918, and um, they like the futurists were like fascinated with machinery and machines of war, and they glorified like speed and movement of modern machinery. Um, and then they like sh chopped up and shattered the images so that like a lot of times they'll be it's almost like a, 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 a stuttering of images I can't think of any other way to um, describe it because they're like trying to show this movement and then in in uh, France um, there was Cubist painting innovated by Pablo Picasso who's Spanish and George George uh, Brock his best friend and then cubism they um they like 
it, it um, like chopped up into geometric shapes form, but it was also influenced by the handheld camera because before when you set up a camera, you would see what was, it was be on a tripod, you'd see what was right in front of you. Um, and you couldn't do all these different angles, but with the handheld camera, you can hold it at all these different angles and you could see things from all different viewpoints and sides. And so the cubists like integrated this into their work where you're not looking at something in a traditional front on position. You're looking at it from the side, from the top, and it also like fractures and chops up the, the imagery into these shapes. So uh, other artists in Russia were like, no, the future is in the peasants, it's in the working class. So they would work, they would look, these artists would look at Russian folk art, which is art that was done by untrained artists who, um, who did these really fantastic and colorful and, and um, wonderful drawings that weren't necessarily skilled as academic artists because they didn't necessarily know structure or perspective of all these other different things. So these artists in Russia are looking at these two different styles of painting and their work starts changing incredibly fast. So one of the artists he becomes friends with is somebody known as uh, Vasily Kandinsky, who had been a lawyer and then had seen work by, I want to say he saw work by um, Monet and, and it just changed the way, I'm oh, sorry, Manet, and it changed the way he started looking at things. So his work starts to become, this is a piece Kandinsky did in 1910. This is called abstract art because we still recognize things like, like buildings and trees, even though they're really abstracted. And Kandinsky's work a lot of times had to do with music, like he would compose paintings that he thought about really carefully. Then he would improvise them where he's just like doing it really rapidly, like here's a tree also. And it's a little chaotic, but then 1913, oh my God, it's, totally chaotic and and just a little crazy and overwhelming i like it but it's overwhelming to look at there's so much going on so in the course of three years Kandinsky's work jumps from something that's abstract and relatively calm to something that's non-representational we don't recognize what's in here anymore and it's more and more chaotic and then another artist is Lubya Popova, she is, as 1910, she's really influenced by the Cubist. This is the um, head that she did. And then all of a sudden, 1913, she's working in a new style that she and another artist developed called Cubo-Futurism, where they're, they're doing like the, they're concerned with movement, but they're also like fracturing and breaking things up. Um, and this is called composition of figures. And if you look really carefully, here's a bowl of fruit, here's a vase, here's a building, here's some people here, here's a guitar, but this has become abstracted where it's chopped up into to shapes and colors. Although we still, if we look carefully, we still recognize what's in the piece. And then another artist, uh, Michael Laornoff, who I'm sure pronounced properly. He was initially influenced by primitivism that we talked about, the folk artists of Russia. And then for really, in the 1913, he's moved on to this new movement that he made up, which is sort of silly, called rayonism, where instead of depicting the subject itself, it depicts the rays that emanate off the subject. Well, this didn't last very long, by the way. You can tell I'm not a fan of it. So Malievich, he's also influenced by Cubism and also the, the um, primitivist artist. 
And so he's working in a style of more academically trained artists that are influenced by primitivism called neo-primitivism. And then three years later, he jumps to the Cubo futuristic style. So again, this is kind of calm and we, although things are abstracted somewhat, they're more simplified, they become even more abstracted in this. And it's like, this is knife grinder. It's like full of movement that reference to the futurist, but then he's chopping things up into shapes. There's more and more shapes in this piece. There's a little bit of shapes in this. There's lots of shapes in this. So we're, we're moving from recognizable figures to less and less recognized where there's, they're chopped up in the shapes. What am I getting at here? Shapes, shapes. Think about his, think about that square on square. So then Russia gets even crazier. It's even more crazy. And this is when they, um, the Russians enter World War One. The uncle of, um, sorry, I keep doing that. The uncle of the Tsar, uh, the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, becomes the commander in chief. Some sources I've read said. He was really um, a good commander. Others say he was just like, had no idea what he was doing. While he is commander, uh, and this is part of the famine and the drought, but also ineffectual leaders, there becomes massive shortages of military food and equipment and medical supplies. And this results in the death of 2 million soldiers alone. The railroad system is incomplete and only goes so far, so they start to ship food but then and supplies, but then they can't get it to where it's going, and um, the food rots. So for regular people, there's food shortages, and they start having high prices, and then the, all this is going on, and then the country's having all these economic problems, and um, then the like the government's unstable and then there's riots and then the government's overthrown by Lenin and the Bolsheviks and then civil war breaks out the the Bolsheviks communists they take over the czar and his family they're imprisoned and then they're all assassinated so just imagine whether you liked your leader your country or not if something like that happens well, one, you're in shock, but two, you want to wipe the slate clean. And so everybody wants to start all over again, and they want the old order wiped out. They want new ways of doing things, and artists want new ways of creating art. So suddenly, they have the freedom to choose and to produce whatever they want to and however they want to. So there's all these different art movements, like I believe I read one time that over 80 different art movements spring up in Russia at this time. And Malevich, he was no different than anybody else. He wanted new things to happen. And his contribution is something called suprematism and dynamic suprematism. So suprematism, both of these, they're non-representational, geometric purity, they reject the bourgeois ideas of representational art. So they don't want to represent anything. They want their art to deal with the supremacy of pure artistic feeling rather on the visual depiction of objects. And they reject any reference to the natural world. So a lot of their work will have geometric forms, primarily the circle, the square, the cross. There'll be a limited color palette. At first it starts out as white, it's black and red. And then with dynamic suprematism, they add in other colors. And there's a real emphasis on texture, which we can't really see reproduced in the slide, but his work it becomes really simplified, non-objective, full of texture. And he wants it to represent pure artistic feeling, which we may, or may not on our end get, but you may. Um, so before the war ended, World War One, he um, he was still doing the Cubo futuristic style, and he was asked to do the costumes and the 
backdrops for um, the first futuristic opera, which was called Victory Over the Sun. So here's the outfits. And then here, what do we have here, is a, a backdrop design. So it's a square, it's kind of divided up with another square, and it just uses black and white in this one. And now, where does that lead us to? That leads us to this, this painting. So it wasn't like you suddenly jump from one style to the next. There was an evolution that got him to the style, and there was a reasoning behind why he decided to quit doing abstract and representational work and start doing totally non-objective. And it had to do with all the chaos and everything that was going on in Russia and the overthrow of the government and the ass assassination of the czar and his family. So as he, as he moves along from 1915, he starts adding more shapes, more color. This is that um, dynamic suprematism. Um, and he continues on in the style somewhat until around 1927. And then what happened? Um, we'll get there in a second. So after the fall of the government, the death of the czar and his family, um, the artists start, they start making artworks in support of the state and its people. They're, they're creating utilitarian artworks, artworks that you can use in everyday lives. So artists are designing fabric and ceramics and propaganda posters. And um, Malevich starts designing these utopian cities. And the models of these are called architetons, pardon me. And then there's people are doing fabric design. But then the Soviets, when they come in, they become more strict and more restrictive and they not objective art is no longer in favor suprematism is no longer in favor Mayevich gets questioned by the secret police other artists are blacklisted others are tortured and killed and so they start you know either you leave russia if you can or you change you compromise and you change your style, which was a lot of them did. And they, they start doing imagery that's in support of the Soviet government and Soviet ideals. Um, so that is the end of our introductory chapter. And I hope that that first painting that I showed you of the square on the white square, although you may not like it, I hope it starts to make more sense to you and then as we move on um other art works of art will stop start not stop hopefully not stop start making sense <laughs>